Randsburg, California, a semi-ghost town located in the Mojave Desert, just a few miles away from Highway 395. In this upcoming episode, we're going to learn a little bit about its history. Hey, good morning. Today we're going to go check out a place called Randsburg. It's in California in the Mojave Desert. It's a living ghost town. It's about 200 miles away from uh, Las Vegas where I live. It's a living ghost town where it's got a few people still left there in the population. Founded in 1896, at least gold was. I'm not sure what time the city was actually uh, founded, but uh, it's got a lot of old history, a lot of old buildings. Used to pass the, by there often way back in the day along 395 when my dad used to take us up camping into the uh, Sierras and Bishop. We're going to go check it out. Um, let's go do some exploration. I got uh, my normal drink for the long drive. I'm probably going to need more than one of these because it's over 200 miles. Let's go do some exploration. Yeah, here I am standing at the living ghost town of Ransburg, California. One of those places located off the 395 highway as you go north from uh, LA to Bishop, California. This is one of those uh, towns that we passed by many, many times as we were a kid while my dad was taking us up to Bishop, California. Ransburg is located only about two or three miles off the 395 highway. It's quite an interesting place. Unfortunately, at this particular time on a Friday afternoon, during the middle of the winter, many of the shops are closed. They don't open until Saturday, but I won't be here. So anyhow, we'll just take a drive up and down the street and check out the, all the old beautiful buildings. Let's start this history discussion by talking about the discovery of gold and the establishment of the Rand or Randsburg Mining District. It is said that wandering prospectors from the El Paso District discovered that the summit range located northeast of the El Paso Mountains also contained placer values and began to dry wash for gold there in the early 1890s. No more than 100 men lived at the summit dry diggings, a tent and dugout camp. Supplies came in from Goller and water from El Paso Willow Spring. At least two prospectors from the summit dry diggings, Frederick Moores, and William Langdon ventured south to explore the Rand Mountains in 1894. Finding only traces of gold, they returned, content at the time, to work with what seemed to be richer earth. Frederick Moores never forgot what he found on Rand Mountain, and a year later, he took a closer look at his earlier find. A group of miners were not happy with the scant returns of the present claims, and they were talking of looking into the ground on the Rand Mountain that he and Langdon had discovered earlier. Concerned with the thought of outsiders cashing in on a find that was his, Moores planned his own trip. Moores and his new partner, John Singleton, decided to take a careful and well-planned look. This required a wagon and a team to carry their mining equipment and camping supplies. Charles Berkton, was one of the few citizens who had a vehicle and pack animals. Thus, their partnership became a trio. The three left camp without informing anyone where they were going and faked a heading to Goller. Once out of sight of the camp, Bertram swung his team south and up the gentle grade to the Rand Mountains. After a period of prospecting in the Sandy Gullies, Bertram and Singleton climbed to the top of one of the stained peaks, and it was there that they found a fantastic ore sample. The partners originally named their discovery the Rand Mine, but later changed it to the Yellow Aster. On April 25, 1895, Moore, Singleton, and Bertram staked their claims. The location work was rushed because the three realized that a discovery like theirs could not be quiet for long. In July of 1895, when the Yellow Aster Mining and Milling Company began to fully understand the magnitude of its bonanza, other prospectors and promoters began to share in the fever. On December 20 of 1895, the Rand Mining District was organized. Randsburg at that time had 13 buildings. Most of them were tents. 
The Randsburg Rush was in full swing in 1896. By December of 1896, the population in Randsburg reached 1,500. Randsburg boasted 50 frame buildings by the end of that same year, and the St. Elmo Hotel was feeding 400 persons a day and lodging 100 a night. Randsburg received its first church and bank in 1897. By October of 1897, it was reported that the Rand District had produced over $600,000 in gold. Also, the Randsburg Railway was nearing completion of a standard gauge line, running 28 miles from the Santa Fe Line at Kramer Junction to within one mile of the Yellow Aster. The Randsburg Railway began operation January 17, 1898. Two days later, fire struck Randsburg. Businessmen and citizens rebuilt the town on the smoldering remains, only to catch fire again on May 6. After each fire, buildings were rebuilt a little bit further apart than before. Randsburg soon became one of the great boom towns of the West. In fact, it even enjoyed the luxury of having a neighboring town rival, known as Johannesburg. In December of 1896, Johannesburg Water and Townsite Company was busy laying out the town. Johannesburg was well planned and even had piped water in the homes. While Randsburg had to have its water hauled to them, and buy it by the gallon or barrel. Two dollars a barrel delivered in town or 40 cents at the well. The Yellow Aster Mine dominated the Randsburg area as far as mines go. There were other mines being found and developed. Randsburg population reached 3,500 in early 1899, and by year's end, the Yellow Aster employed 150 men and it had a payroll of $13,000 a month. Early in 1900, a water source was discovered over at Goler. They built a pumping plant and forced water up an eight-mile grade to Randsburg in preparation for the completion of the Yellow Aster's 100-stamp mill. The Yellow Aster's new 100 stamp mill was completed in 1902, producing gold worth about $100,000 a month, equating to about $3.6 million today. With the new mill in operation, the older 30 stamp mill was used to treat only the higher grade ores. Both mills ran 24 hours a day in the 100 stamp mill consisting of 20 batteries of 5 stamps each four batteries a week would be shut down and cleaned up. This allowed each stamp to be run at least a month between cleanups. Randsburg, by the beginning of the 20th century, had settled into a calm period of average, modest mining production. No new gold discoveries were made after 1900, and the easy diggings had been worked and reworked. The load mines were being run by companies and corporations, and the gold placer mines yielded less and less. Yellow Aster's production declined during the First World War, and it closed in 1918. It reopened in 1921 and worked intermittently until 1933, when it was taken over by the Anglo-American Mining Corporation, who sold it in 1940 to John Cummins & Company, who worked it until 1956. In 1983, Glamis Gold purchased Yellow Aster, and they continued their open pit mining process. By 2006, all remaining gold-bearing rock had been extracted, and operations ceased for the final time. Randsburg is considered a living ghost town, and according to the latest consensus, there's a population of 78 people. Today, Randsburg is a popular stop for photographers, antique car clubs, and families. Movies and TV commercials are frequently filmed in and around the town. Most of them are low budget, 
However, there was a great movie that was uh, done in 2011 called Cowboys and Aliens. Some of the desert backdrop scenes were filmed nearby Randsburg. Be sure to stop at Randsburg on your next trip through Highway 395 in California. You'll love the Old West charm, and the people are as friendly as they get. Gold was discovered in this area in the late 1890s, like 1896, I believe, in a uh, mine called the Yellow West Star Mine. It was quite successful over the years. This town, I'm not sure exactly when it was established, but you can see that many of the buildings are very old. It's nice and quiet today on this Friday afternoon in early December. Most of the places don't open until the weekend. So unfortunately, I can't go in and explore a lot of the buildings inside. Here's some more of the town's uh, boardwalk. Most everything closed on Friday afternoon in early December, which is normal. This place only comes alive during the weekends. Let's take a drive around town and let's see what we can find. <laughs> 